coming up this week on The Travel Show. I'm uncovering ancient treasures amongst Spain's living sand dunes. This is a melting pot of cultures, and all of those peoples have left their archaeological site, which have been kept perfectly intact down the millennia. Cats in the UK's northernmost city. Here's a clue where. The site's really significant. It's had castles that have been burnt, besieged, mm -hmm. rebuilt. Mary Queen of Scots, Robert the Bruce have all had connections with this place. And why Greenland is fast becoming a bucket list destination at the top of the world. We decided on Greenland. A reason was to experience climate change at the hub of it, so to speak. The huge sand dunes of southern Spain are some of the largest in Europe, and yet they remain relatively unknown, even amongst the most well-explored travellers, with even fewer people aware of the treasures concealed beneath their moving sands. I'm meeting Eddie Pitcher, a writer and travel journalist who specialises in uncovering hidden places, and she's going to guide me off the beaten track on my mission to learn more about the living sand dunes of southern Spain. Eddie, where are you taking me today? So we are taking the wild way to uh, Bologna Beach. And we can see that this is the way because we've got knotted, knotted <laughs> beach grass here. There are no signs, so it's, I said it was a wild way. I'm definitely glad that Eddie's here to show me the way on this one. Oh, yeah. look at this. There you go, so you've got your desert dune there. Wow. This is the Bologna sand dune, one of Spain's largest sand dunes, standing at over 30 metres high and 200 metres wide. All concealed within the Estreco Nature Park, one of Cadiz's most unspoilt and off the beaten track areas. We did it, we did it. <laughs> Probably the best way to think about this coastline, which is endlessly shifting down the centuries, is as a living sand dune. And now with climate change, um, the winds are getting stronger and pushing with them these dunes. So they're really moving. Yeah, exactly. These dunes are being battered by hurricane force winds, forcing them inland and revealing some remarkable hidden history concealed below. If you think about it in terms of history, this is a melting pot of cultures. You've got Africa, you've got Europe, you've got them, all of the Mediterranean and then the travels across the Atlantic. And all of those peoples have left their vestiges, their, their archaeological sites along this coastline, which have been kept perfectly intact down the millennia. My next stop is Cape Trafalgar, 60 kilometres down the coast from Bologna, where archaeologists from the University of Cadiz have just discovered some remarkable ruins thanks to these moving sands. Inicialmente solamente se veía la parte superior de dos piedras, el resto estaba bajo la duna. So when you discovered and realized it was a tomb, you must have been preparing to find some some bones in here, right? So uh, excavate here is very similar to excavation in Egypt tombs and the sand preserves uh, very well the, the bones. Mm -hmm. So the state of preservation of the tomb, of the bones, the great goods, is excellent. We have an arrowhead. Tiene 4,000 años de antigüedad. Cooper pendant. <gasps> I can't believe I'm holding my hand, a piece of jewelry from thousands of years ago. That is amazing. Por último. A bead. Las dunas tienen un problema. Gente del equipo decía, Buah, si no fuera por las dunas, tendríamos aquí 15 o 20 tumbas. Y por otro lado yo les dije, gracias a las dunas, las tumbas están tapadas. Es decir, sabemos que aquí en el tómbolo de Trafalgar estaba la necrópolis, la ciudad de los muertos. No sabemos cuántas tumbas puede haber debajo de estas dunas, ¿no? de esta arena. Eso es un misterio, de momento no, no lo sabemos, pero es una de las interrogantes que vamos a intentar resolver en los próximos años. And these aren't the last of the mysteries which this magnificent coastline is concealing. 
Finding two Neolithic tombs is extraordinary enough, but this coast has even more buried treasures. In fact, looking around, I can see people lying on their beach towels, probably not knowing that beneath them could be a whole ancient Roman settlement. If you are on the beach and you have an umbrella and you leave your umbrella on the beach in a windy area, after some hours, it will be completely covered by the sun. And this is what has happened here. So what can you tell me about this site? What are these walls? This is the roof, more or less, wow. of the Roman bath. So it's much deeper. Yes. So how, how deep do we have to go down? Four meters down. Four meters. Yeah. But could we have a go at maybe exposing just a bit of it to see more what's down there? Yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. All right. Four meters is a long way yeah. down. This is going to take me probably more than the afternoon, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to accept defeat here. Besides, the archaeologists have purposefully decided to cover up this site with sand in order to protect it from the elements, a decision which might prove difficult in the long term thanks to those strong winds and shifting sands. To find out if there's an alternative method of preservation, I've come back to where I started my trip. Bologna, home to Bilo Claudia, an ancient Roman city dating back to the second century BC, and one of Andalusia's most significant and well-preserved ancient Roman archaeological sites. With the wind blowing so constantly, you may not be able to preserve these ruins covered in sand for future generations. So there's an alternative, which is to create something like this place. This was what, forgotten for 2,000 years, and then suddenly some sand shifted, and we discover it was in fact a really important place. Yes, it would have been really famous, so that people would talk about the products from Milo Claudia all around the Mediterranean, and in all these banquets from the Romans, they would love to have products from here. It's quite a, an interesting site. We've got these incredible ancient ruins, and then over there, someone applying suntan lotion and sunbathing on the beach. <laughs> I guess this is yeah. like like this coast just in one image there. So here we have our history, our past and our present. In front of us. <laughs> I was hiking up on that enormous dune and you could really see how all the sand was really shifting inland. And if that's happening all around the coast here, is this a good thing for revealing exciting archaeological finds or a concerning thing about the preservation of those finds? I think this is a great example of how to do things right, but it took also decades to both excavate, preserve and make the right combination between the research and the visitors. And it would be great if some of them can be open to the public so there is like a route that the people can do. Let's hope that, if it's handled correctly, this part of Spain can uncover and preserve more incredible historical sites for future generations no matter what direction the wind blows. And if you're thinking of heading to this part of southern Spain anytime soon, here are some travel show tips on things to see and do. If you're a meat lover, then maybe put the Andalusian village of Ardales on your bucket list because every February they hold a festival there that proves just how much the Spanish love their pork. You'll find all kinds of traditional mouth-watering local dishes on sale there. And in true Spanish style, there's plenty of drinking and dancing way into the night. If you prefer a slightly more tranquil trip, then why not head for Doñana National Park? Its sand dunes, marshes and plains are home to lots of local wildlife, including some endangered species such as the Iberian lynx. It's also a great place for some bird watching, as it's on the route where huge flocks of birds migrate to and from Africa every year. And Seville, of course, is usually high on everyone's list. It's southern Spain's largest tourist destination, and for good reason. Filled with historic architecture, palaces and museums, it's also where you can find a very unique bar, set in an historic Islamic bathhouse dating back to the days of Al-Andalus, or Muslim Spain. It's one of the few places you can see original 12th century Moorish decoration, like this, still in situ. Still to come on The Travel Show, 
We're day tripping in the Scottish Highlands. I'm not going to say there is or there isn't a creature in Loch Ness, um, but I have seen some strange phenomenon on the water. And could this be the next must-see destination for the more adventurous travellers among us? Now everything is just even more busy than 2019. All the hotels are completely booked and cruise ships are back. So don't go away. With restrictions relaxed, I'm travelling across the UK to see how the country's top attractions are doing, to meet the people getting us excited about travel again and hear their plans for the new normal. This time, I'm in the Scottish Highlands. from Inverness, the northernmost city in the UK and the gateway to the Scottish Highlands. It's also home to a very famous resident, Nessie, aka the Loch Ness Monster. But I want to see what else there is to do in the city, so let's go. Pre-pandemic, Inverness and Loch Ness welcomed up to 1.6 million visitors a year. It's also one of the country's fastest growing cities. Now I've heard there is an unofficial official cake of Inverness. And it's made by a family-run bakery that first opened shop here back in 1898. It's called a dream ring. Very creamy. It looks like a donut, but it's 100% not a donut. Inverness Castle used to be a prison and a courtroom, but now it's undergoing major renovations to turn it into a visitor attraction. This is the grand entrance lobby. Stuart started on this project just before lockdown and it's expected to be fully complete in 2025. Well you can already see we've made an opening in the wall there. We're going to let the public spill out there onto a new terrace. And here we are at the top of Inverness Castle and this is the view you get. This is spectacular. Inverness is a great wee city. The site's really significant. It's had Castles that have been burnt, besieged, mm -hmm. rebuilt. Mary Queen of Scots, Robert the Bruce have all had connections with this place. So when people come, what would they expect to see? So they should get a fantastic sort of immersive experience that uh, tells them stories of the Highlands, mm -hmm. find out about places that they've never heard about and hear stories they've never heard about. And the hope is that that will inspire them to then go out and visit these places, which are dotted around the far reaches of the islands. Did you find with the pandemic it reframed your thinking of how to create the spaces? It galvanised our design in a way, so we had to try and figure out ways that you could loop round and avoid passing over in tight spaces. Because before that, that wasn't even part of your considerations, doing one-way systems? Yeah, no, one-way systems weren't really a thing, but we've tried to make it not obvious though. You feel like you're exploring a castle. Because yeah. who knows what 2025 will look like, so I guess in some ways the pandemic has future-proofed the design of the visitor attraction. Definitely. For some though, it hasn't been about getting through the past few years, but rather a chance to start something new. My next stop requires a little car journey out into the highlands, where from July to October, the heather grows wild and in abundance. Oh, hi, Kat. Hi. This is beautiful. Oh, it's great, isn't it? So what we're looking for is the nice blooming parts of the heather. So what type of flavour does this give the gin? So yeah, if you can smell it, it's quite a mossy, kind of earthy, subtle smell to it. But when you, when you put it in gin and you distill it, it gives a lovely honeysuckle, really wow. quite subtle floral taste to the gin. Daniel is collecting heather to make gin. It's one of the main locally sourced botanicals that he uses. It all started as a hobby after moving back to Inverness during lockdown. Then 13 months ago, he turned gin making into a business with plans afoot to run experiences for visitors to make their own. So one of the packages will be that you can hand forage their botanicals that you can take to the distillery and you can make your own gin, your own blend of gin. Well, with our heather in hand, it's time to head to his distillery a couple miles away along Loch Ness. You want to give me a wee hand? Please? I would love to. Excellent. 
So it took us 86 attempts to get our, our launch product to where we wanted it to be. 86 attempts? 86, yeah. Well, whilst we leave this to do its magic overnight, it'd be a shame not to try it. So as they say in the business, here's one we made earlier. Slangeva. Slangeva. I like that word. Mm. As we're so close to the lock, I can't leave without at least saying hi to Nessie. The lock stretches for 23 miles and contains more water than all the lakes in England and Wales combined. Lots of good hiding spots then. Well, there we go, just past the red and green markers, which means we are officially on Loch Ness. So given that you've done over 400 trips with tourists all hunting for the Loch Ness Monster, how many times have you seen Nessie? Gary, I think, claims to have seen Nessie three times, but I always tell the guests that he hasn't seen Nessie since he stopped drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that is why you gave me the champagne at the start. Exactly. Better chance to see the monster. You tried to trick me with those waves earlier. <laughs> I'm not going to say there is or there isn't uh, a, a creature in Loch Ness, um, but I have seen some strange phenomenon on the water, like the waves, um, and, and you know they really catch you out and you, you'll, you'll see a log on the surface traveling the wrong way against the current and you think how can that be but then there's lots of scientific ex explanations for it but yeah it, it, it can be quite interesting. Aside from Nessie it's a beautiful trip past castle ruins through stunning landscapes a perfect way to end my day trip to Inverness and as more tourists return perhaps something else will too. Okay, to finish off this week, we're off to Il Lulisat in northern Greenland, a place where dramatic glaciers, spectacular icebergs, and a rich Inuit culture combine to make a once-in-a-lifetime bucket list destination. But this most northerly part of the world is on the brink of change in more ways than one, as Keith Wallace now reports. Lying inside the Arctic Circle is the coastal town of Ilulisset. It's a place that lives up to its namesake, meaning iceberg in Greenlandic. So this place is a unique place because of the icebergs. It gives me thrill because I never know how the water is going to be and how the ice condition is going to be. In. Amid the pandemic, tourism came to a standstill here. But now it's booming again. Yes, yes. This is my sixth season working in tourism. People come here to meet uh, Inuit. They know us for being welcoming, but also they come here obviously for the ice and the northern lights and the whales. I see more and more people knowing about Greenland. Trump <laughs> wanted to buy Greenland back in 2019 which made a lot of people search about Greenland, also because a lot of more people are talking a lot more about climate change. We choose to come up here to Ilulisset to uh, see the, the big icebergs. <laughs> we decided on Greenland. A reason was to experience climate change at the hub of it, so to speak. The nature is amazing. In Austria we also have glaciers, but not such an experience. The local population is less than 5,000, but 10 times more visitors are expected this summer. 2019 was the busiest tourist year ever in Greenland. Then came COVID and everything just shut down completely. Greenland closed its borders, so you couldn't, uh, as a tourist you couldn't come here. And now everything is just even more busy than 2019. All the hotels are completely booked and cruise ships are back. Tourism is growing in importance, but there are still challenges. Towns are spread out and transport links are limited. But soon, three new airports will be built. Everything will be new completely new airport. The future runway will allow passenger planes with 300 passengers to uh, land and take off. 
you now in the future will be able to fly directly from Copenhagen, Frankfurt, London, New York City. Local officials say they're making efforts to avoid over-tourism. We try to learn from Iceland, so we often go there to learn what they have done, like when it boomed. There is a glacier named Sommerkjöldr, meaning the southern glacier. It is one of the most active and fastest moving glaciers in the world. Because of the ice yard, there is rich life in the ocean. Iduriset is both a touristic city but also a fishery city, so it is very important for the local community. This unique place is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it's also seeing the impact of climate change. And that's explored at the Ice Fjord Centre, Iduriset's newest attraction. The Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet. For centuries, the Inuit have lived with the ice. But traditional ways of life are also shifting. Anna Sophie and Fleming own a sled dog tour business. We have a 33 Greenlandic sled dogs. It's a very unique kind of breed. They are uh, adapted to, the, to being out in the nature, also when it's very cold outside. It's just loving to ride the sled dogs and also going for hunting or fishing. Det er meget vigtigt at jeg skal have hunden hele tiden. Det mener jeg også min far og min barndom. I mange år siden næsten alle sammen det har hunde, men det ændrer sig jo meget nu, at det har ikke så mange hunde tilbage. The snowmobile has taken over the tasks of the sled dogs. Jeg er ikke så glad at hunden det blev ligesom Det blev meget væk fra kulturen, for den der kultur, jeg vil gerne bevare den, som min far har også gør det. Well, that's all we have time for, sadly, on this week's show. But here's what's coming up next week. There's more from Kat as we retrace her journey across the UK, as the country prepared for a bumper summer of tourism following two years of travel restrictions. I was thinking about how I could do something different. The afternoon tea taxi tour would be ideal because you're all encapsulated in the back of the taxi. It's proved really popular. Well, that sounds like a good one, so do join us then if you can. And don't forget in the meantime to check us out on social media and you can find all sorts of other great travel content from the BBC. Until next time, from me, Crystal Larwood and the Travel Show team here in southern Spain, it's goodbye.